Hey, it's Joseph, and today I'm showing you how to create this wall shadow effect in Framer. It's a cool way to take a website with kind of a printerly vibe and bring it to life, make it look like there's actual light, like it lives in an environment on a wall. So let's jump in and look at how it's done. All right, to show you how I do this, I'm just working with a template here, a very light mode, very kind of stark, almost printerly looking template. I'll show you afterwards how to apply this to a dark mode template as well. Uh, but here, we're just starting with something that's light and bright and looks like it could be on a wall in a room. So let's make it look like it's really on a wall in a room. Uh, this all starts with having an image that contains our shadows. And I've got a bunch of images that look like shadows projected on a wall. Now, story time. I made these. These are not just a bunch of blurry shapes from a Photoshop document. These are actually modeled in 3D. I modeled a little room in 3D. I created a window. I put an HDR environment of an outside scene that has the sun coming through. The sun breaks through the window, going through a variety of trees or uh, blinds. I created a bunch of different combinations, ended up with about 200 of them. And that is what I'm using here. In fact, if you want to grab these two packs for yourself, I put them up on my website, shapefest.com. I'll drop a link in the description below. So let's start by grabbing one of these that fits our vibe. Some of these are a little more dense than others. Some are a little more sparse. Uh, let's find one that's like a happy medium. Maybe this one up here, not too dense, not too sparse. I'm gonna drag this onto the canvas, and once it's done importing, it's gonna land in the wrong place, naturally. So I'm just gonna move it up to the very top of my breakpoint, so it jumps to the front and uh, sort of dominates the canvas here. And uh, now what we wanna do, we want this to remain fixed in place, so that when we scroll the website up and down, the shadow remains fixed. Like the website's moving, the content's moving, but the wall isn't. So I'm going to switch this from relative to fixed. And before I go any further, we've got some competition going on in terms of this and the content that's behind it right now that's in front of it. And that is a Z index issue. So before I go any further, I'm going to go down here to our style properties. And because this is absolute positioned and it's within a stack, we automatically get a Z index property. Uh, Framer does us a favor and gives us this Z index property. So we don't have to add it manually. I'm just gonna dial this all the way up to 10. 10 is the highest level of Z index. And if you're not familiar with Z index, it basically just allows you to choose a layer that the content goes on from front to back. So by default, everything is at zero. If you set this to negative one, you're basically saying, I want this to go behind everything by default uh, or everything that's left at the default rather. And then you also have layers in front. You have one, two, three, four, all the way up through 10. So by saying Z index 10, I'm saying, I want this to be on top of everything that's at the default of zero, everything that's at one, everything that's at two, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, I just want this on top pretty much no matter what. So I'm going to leave the Z index there at 10, the highest that we have to choose from. And now I'm going to play with our width and height. Um, I don't need to link the width and height together. I don't need to lock the aspect ratio. Uh, I do want my width to be relative because I always want it to fill 100% of the viewport. And up here, you'll see that uh, we're sort of aligning relative to the left edge. We don't want that. We, we're going to toggle that off. Uh, when you're not aligning or pinning, rather, to the left or right edge, uh, the object, the layer, just kind of floats relative to the center. And I also want it to be absolute center. I don't, I don't want it to be off center. So I'm going to use the alignment button here at the very top of the properties panel. So now it's aligned relative to the center. At the center, it's going to stay in the center. And it's going to stay in the center and fill the entire width because we're set to 100% width. Now the height, on the other hand, our relative unit for height, at least the one that we should be using in this case, is called viewport. Because we don't know how tall the end user, the visitor of the website, we don't know how tall the browser is going to be. They might be on a smaller device or a larger device. They might have their window filling their screen height. They might have their window shrunk down. So by choosing viewport, and by choosing 100 VH, 100 viewport height units, we're saying fill 100% of the height of the browser window, no matter how big or how small that gets. 
So this combination right here, 100% relative width and 100 VH mean fill the full width of the browser and fill the full height of the browser. So there we go. We're covered, literally. In fact, we can go to the preview window and just make absolutely sure. And sure enough, it's covering everything and everything remains covered. And if this gets bigger or smaller, uh, ignore that flickering. That's just like a little preview artifact here. Everything remains covered at all times. So I'm going to go back. And now we just need to make this look like a real shadow that's kind of composited with all the content that's behind it. So to do that, I'm just going to head back down to our styles and I'm going to add a new style that's not there by default, one called blending. This lets us choose a blending mode and it defaulted to a blending mode called multiply. And that is in fact what we want. If you're not familiar with blending modes, uh, specifically if you're not familiar with the multiply blending mode, what that does is it says the darker or the more dense a pixel is, the higher its opacity and the lighter or you know, higher luminance a pixel is, the lower its opacity. So basically only the dark stuff stays. The light stuff fades away into 0% opacity. So by choosing that, we've got our grays and our darker grays all sort of kind of burning in and darkening our image here. Now, I think this is too far. And really, most of these images go too far. Most of the images that I created go too far. And that's fine because we can play with the contrast. We can play with the opacity. So I'm just going to dial back the opacity. And uh, sometimes it's nice to go all the way down to zero and work your way back up. It's easier to find the point at which it's too much if you start from zero. If you back your way back down, you might think, oh, I'm making this too light when it's really not too light. You've just kind of adjusted to it being too strong. Uh, but I'm going to leave it at somewhere in the in the middle, around the middle, 0.4 opacity, 40% opacity. And now we should be good. If we go and preview this in the preview window, this website template happens to have some animation. So that comes in. And then as I scroll, there we have it. Our shadow is burning into the entire website because it's on top of everything. It's not a background. It's on top of everything. And it's being composited with everything that's behind it. Just like if this was a printed publication on a wall reflecting light, the shadows would be cast upon all of the content, no matter what. And since what really makes this effect work in the first place is that our shadow image is in the foreground on top of everything, rather than being in the background, we've now got an issue where that image is blocking the cursor from clicking on anything that's behind it. So this is a really simple fix. All we need to do is make sure we have that frame selected that's in front of everything head over to the properties panel and click the little plus sign next to styles. On this menu here, you'll find an item called pointer events, and that's exactly what we want. And when we add pointer events, by default, you'll see that the pointer property is here and it's now set to none, and that's exactly what we want. Now the pointer will completely ignore this element, even though it's in the front, and we can click through it to select links and click on anything and everything that's interactive on the page. Problem solved. So that's that for our light mode example. Let's head over to a dark mode example. And in this example, I actually already have pretty much exactly the same thing on top of this. I have one of my images. I have it set to multiply blend mode. And we basically have a dark thing making a dark thing darker, which doesn't do much good. In this case, for dark mode, we got to kind of flip the paradigm. We have to say we want to take the light that's breaking through and we want to see that show up composited with our web page here. So to do that, I'm going to start by swapping the image out with one that's a little bit more conducive to dark mode. So again, I've got this darker pack. I've got that lighter pack. Uh, let's grab something from the darker pack here. Let's see. I'm going to try not to get too neurotic about my choice here, but that's going to be difficult because I want to pick something good. Uh, let's say this one. This one's nice and dark, super dark. So I'm going to drop that on here. And now we've solved half of the problem. Now we have an image that is uh, conducive to inverting this effect. But now we need to actually invert it. And the way we do that is by switching that blending mode from multiply to screen, which is exactly the opposite in terms of how it handles luminance and opacity. So the screen blending mode will take things that are brighter, that have more lightness, and make them closer to 100% opacity, pure white being 100% opaque and it will take pixels that are less bright and make them more transparent. So black pixels become 100% transparent, white pixels remain 100% opaque. So now only the light breaks through, 
but there is some lightness sort of in those shadows in those midtones. So if we don't like how this is compositing, if it's like lightening the whole thing too much, let me actually crank this. You can see here that it is lightening uh, in the shadows because there is a certain amount of light in the shadows. There's a certain amount of light bouncing around the room uh, in that 3D scene uh, where I created these images from. So what we can do here is we can add another style. We can create a filter and you could always do this to the image beforehand. You don't have to do it programmatically using the tools that are effectively CSS based. Uh, but since I'm already here, I'm just going to do it programmatically. I'm going to add the contrast filter. And as I bring the contrast filter up, the shadows get darker, the highlights get lighter, and we end up with something that's a little bit more dramatic. Now, I'm going to go overly dramatic on the contrast because I'm going to bring the opacity down to bring the drama back down to something a bit more realistic because I don't want those highlights to be washing out the content and making it less visible, less readable. So let's preview that. There we have it. So now our highlights are breaking through, our shadows are basically transparent, uh, which allows the dark mode of the website, the dark backgrounds, the dark uh, environment of the website to come through and do its own thing. That's it. And you may have noticed that this is the first Framer tutorial that I've done on this channel, but I plan on doing plenty more. This channel is going to be all about design and Framer, web design, etc. But all of my tooling tutorials are going to be Framer tutorials from now on. So if you're a Framer user or interested in using Framer, subscribe, hit the like button if you think this video should be easier to find for others, and head to shapefest.com and grab those packs for yourself. See you soon.